Thanks, Jennifer Preston. I work for the Canadian Friends Service Committee, which is the service arm of the Quakers in Canada, and I'm your moderator this afternoon. Um, we are uh, here, as you can see, for the special uh, event panel on resource development and the human rights of Indigenous peoples. And first, um, I'm just going to start by thanking the co-sponsors that put this event on, which is our hosts here at the University, the Centre of International Policy Studies, and also Amnesty International, the Assembly of First Nations, and the uh, Canadian Press Service Committee. So, we are going to go, we have the room for about two hours. We're going to have about um, uh, less than half of that time as presentation time, and then we'll have a good amount of time for question and answer. Um, our focus is on resource development, but it's also in the context of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. There's several um, handouts and things that you can take away, and also things, there's some, some petitions as well up on the table here, and including, there's a booklet versions of the UN Declaration, so if any of you actually don't have this booklet, there are some up here at the table that you can get. We're having this event today because tomorrow is the fifth anniversary of the adoption of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples by the United Nations. And um, there's a, many organizations in Canada that work collaboratively, Indigenous organizations and human rights organizations. And we were talking about what can we do for the fifth anniversary and, and what kind of a theme did we want to focus on. And we talked about focusing on resource development because the threats to indigenous people's lands uh, undermine their human rights on so many levels. And we also wanted to be looking at that from both a domestic context here in Canada, but also what that looks like outside of Canada. And Amnesty International has been doing a lot of work in Colombia, and so um, we, we decided that that's what we would combine the situation both in Canada and in Colombia, looking at resource development on the lands of indigenous peoples. So before we go to our uh, guest speakers that are here today, I just wanted to say a quick word about the Declaration, um, assuming that uh, many of you may not know a lot about the Declaration. And one of the uh, pieces that is a stumbling block for us in our work is that there, is a, there has been a very good messaging campaign that the Declaration is aspirational and it has no legal effect. And, and both of those statements are simply erroneous. And so we think that it's very important to understand that indeed it does have legal effect and it is much more than being aspirational. And, the, um, uh, and in fact, we have now uh, legal jurisprudence uh, which, which emphasizes that the declaration can be used in the interpretation of both Canadian policy and also in legislation. So it's, it's very clearly grounded. We also know that there is a lot of misconceptions about how you use international law in the domestic context, which is, which is also something to overcome. But it's, it's another example, it's another area where the declaration being very solidly part of international human rights law, and that does have real um, applicability in the domestic context. So, so it, it's something that we're using both in the international context, but also in the domestic context. Um, and so in, in that vein, we produced a joint statement, several organizations produced a joint statement, copies of which are at the front, and that was released today um, to commemorate the fifth anniversary. And the statement is focusing on uh, resource development and resource extraction, and also the issue of free, prior, and informed consent. And the end of this statement is has uh, recommendations to the government of Canada, which we'll get to at the end of the presentation. So, and in our statement, we're also focusing on both the domestic situation and also Colombia. Um, I'm just going to give you a quote from. The, the United Nations has a mechanism which is called the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And that position is currently held by Professor James Anaya. And he has just uh, released his report. He gives an annual report to the Human Rights Council. And his report for 2012 has just gone to the Human Rights Council. And in that report, he says, consultation and consent and related safeguards that are instrumental to Indigenous Peoples' rights 
in the face of extractive industries that operate or seek to operate on or near their territories, but understanding the reach of those underlying substantive rights and the potential impacts on those rights must be a starting point for solving the many questions that arise in this context. And that's the kind of topic that we're going to hear about and that we want to explore this afternoon um, from our speakers. So, uh, without any further to do, um, first I'm just going to introduce both of them and then, uh, and then we'll hear from them. So at the very end of the table we have Anne-Marie Sam and Anne-Marie has come uh, with her daughter uh, today. They've arrived last night. Um, and Anne-Marie is from the Nakazli First Nation, which is in central British Columbia. And her family has lost access to their traditional lands because of a large open pit mine. Um, and in addition, her community is also going to be affected by the Northern Gateway Pipeline. Uh, Anne-Marie is the founder of the First Nations Women Advocating Responsible Mining, and she's also a board member for Mining Watch Canada. And first, we're going to hear from our guest who's come in just this week from Colombia. Luis Evales Andrade is the Chief Counselor with ONIC, which is the National Indigenous Organization of Colombia. And uh, the Colombian Constitutional Court has concluded that at least one third of the 102 distinct indigenous nations in Colombia face an imminent risk of total annihilation as a consequence of forced displacement from their lands. And I believe that in Colombia is the country that has the, the largest degree of forced displacement of lands of indigenous peoples around from in anywhere in the world. Uh, and Luis is actually here this week doing a lot of uh, work around trying to raise some awareness um, around these issues. And um, Onik is campaigning for the enforcement of protective measures ordered by the court and to respect the right of free prior and informed consent. And this is also in the, some of the work that's being done is also in the context of the fact that Canada has just ratified a free trade um, agreement with Colombia but has not taken to under, do, undertaken any evaluation of human rights abuses um, in relation and obligation of, of that treaty. So Luis is going to be our first speaker, and what, Luis will be speaking in Spanish, and Michael Clarté is our interpreter, and so we'll hear from Luis, and, uh, and Michael will repeat for us in English. Muy buenas tardes para todos y todas. Good afternoon to everyone. Cuando entré a esta universidad, esa es la universidad, sentí que todo estaba muy, mucho silencio. When I walked into this university building uh, a few minutes ago, I found it to be quite quiet and peaceful. Y entonces pensé, ojalá no sea sinónimo de silencio, indiferencia frente a lo que pasa. En los pueblos indígenas. And I thought to myself, I hope this isn't a metaphor for the silence of all of us in the face of uh, the realities of indigenous peoples in the world. Sino que por el contrario, debe ser el espacio para reflexionar y discutir sobre las problemáticas que afectan a nuestros pueblos, a nuestras naciones. A university should be exactly the opposite, a space where we can discuss uh, the great challenges um, and difficulties uh, in our communities, in indigenous communities in Canada and around the world. Que el silencio sea para profundizar sobre las determinaciones, las decisiones que toman nuestros gobiernos. So that this silence may be uh, an opportunity and a space for reflection around decisions made by our governments. Es decir, la academia tiene una alta responsabilidad en el presente, con el presente y el futuro de nuestros pueblos. And I think it's important to say that the academy, in fact, has a very important uh, role to play in the present and the future of our peoples. Y es en ese sentido y en ese contexto que voy a expresar algunas preocupaciones de los pueblos indígenas de Colombia. And it's in that light and in that context that I'd like to share with you some of uh, my thoughts about the current reality of indigenous peoples in Colombia. Y que seguramente, guardando las proporciones, es la misma que experimentan muchos pueblos indígenas del mundo. And perhaps with differences in, in degree, um, 
and severity uh, is the same experience that indigenous peoples face in many other countries and other parts of the world. Lo primero que quiero recordar es que para los pueblos indígenas la historia no ha cambiado tanto. The first thing I'd like to remind everyone here of is that for indigenous peoples history in fact has not changed that much. La conquista y el genocidio cometido en tiempos anteriores fue por nuestros recursos. The conquest that happened in past centuries, the conquering of our peoples by other peoples, uh, took place uh, with uh, resource extraction at, at, its, at, at its heart and very much part of that context. Ejemplo de eso tenemos muchos en los distintos países. There are many examples of this throughout the Americas. Y, y hoy la lucha que ciframos los pueblos indígenas de Colombia y de muchas partes del mundo tienen que ver con la presencia de empresas no necesariamente en nuestros países sino también de países extranjeros que quieren extraer y llevarse los recursos naturales de nuestros territorios. And this is still very much the reality today. So the, the difficulties faced by our peoples in Colombia and in many other countries have to do then with the presence often of uh, foreign companies and their desire to extract resources from our lands. Si en la conquista y en la colonia se utilizó el requerimiento, era una figura jurídica, algo que hacía para justificar la dominación y el saqueo de nuestros recursos hoy, se utiliza los cambios y las reformas legales de nuestros países para legitimar el saqueo de esos territorios. And the, the discourse around justifying uh, the extraction of uh, resources in our, in our lands have not really changed that much since colonial times. In colonial times there was a whole discourse around the, the building of empire, around uh, monopolies. Today we hear a, a discourse that uh, uh, has to do with reforming uh, legislation, uh, deregulating um, and changing laws to allow for uh, easier access by companies to resources. Tengo que aclarar que uh, en términos legales, en términos teóricos, pues hay unos reconocimientos eh, y unos avances en, en los órdenes internos, pero también en el orden internacional. I sh should recognize right away that both theoretically and uh, uh, jurisprudentially and legally, there have been some advances made in terms of the recognition of uh, certain rights. Las reformas constitucionales en América Latina, eh, la declaración y los distintos instrumentos asumidos en el marco de las Naciones Unidas, así lo muestran. Reforms to various constitutions in Latin American countries and also a number of um, conventions and instruments that have been developed at the UN at the international level um, show that this in fact is the case. El problema es que los mismos estados que firman estos, estas leyes, estas declaraciones son los que después no la implementan y la incumplen. The problem of course is that the same states who sign on to these international declarations and conventions and who reform their own constitutions and laws then do not uh, implement and put into practice uh, what they have assigned. La Declaración de Naciones Unidas sobre Derechos Indígenas, el Convenio 169 de la OIT, Organización Internacional del Trabajo, son expresamente claros sobre el comportamiento que deben te de tener los Estados respecto de los derechos indígenas. Both the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the ILO's uh, Convention 169 are very clear on the responsibility of states with regards to the rights of indigenous peoples um, in the context of extractive uh, activities. Volviendo a la idea de, de, de esa dinámica permanente de saqueo de nuestros recursos, quiero señalar que los tratados de libre comercio, en este caso el Tratado de Libre Comercio Colombia-Canadá, no es más que un instrumento que legitima la entrada de empresas a nuestros territorios. And coming back to this theme of the 
the rape, for lack of a better word, of our resources. Um, the, uh, the free trade agreement between Canada and Colombia is precisely an example of an agreement that allows uh, for an opening up of our lands, uh, ancestral uh, homelands, to companies to come in and um, take the resources that are found there. Quiero señalar que el Tratado de Libre Comercio con Canadá, Colombia, Canadá, no fue consultado a los pueblos indígenas. And I'd like to point out to all of you here, very importantly, that the Canada-Colombia Free Trade Agreement was not done, was not negotiated, was not written with any consultation, meaningful consultation with the indigenous peoples of Colombia. La reforma al Código Minero en Colombia apunta precisamente a generar Seguridad jurídica para las empresas e inseguridad jurídica para los pueblos indígenas y sus territorios. And in fact, the reform of the mining law in Colombia had as, as its very uh, explicit purpose to uh, ensure the security of companies and corporations in their activities in Colombia and, and make sure that precisely that security uh, was not offered and extended to individuals and communities. Nosotros tenemos una alta preocupación porque la Corte Constitucional ha señalado que uno de los factores de riesgo de exterminio de nuestros pueblos son los megaproyectos económicos en los territorios. And we are very concerned because this is a very urgent moment in Colombia. Our own constitutional court, the highest court in the land, has said that um, we, we are at a, a, a place now in Colombia where it is precisely the activities of many of these mining companies that are contributing to the extermination and disappearance of a number of indigenous nations and peoples in Colombia. Y la situación se hace mucho más grave en la medida en que en Colombia existe conflicto armado. And of course this is made even uh, more complicated and difficult by the fact that Colombia is a country uh, that has a a long standing uh, armed conflict. En la última década, en las últimas décadas, se ha podido comprobar que todos los conflictos armados, los procesos de desplazamiento forzoso de los campesinos, indígenas y afrocolombianos de sus territorios, ha obedecido a intereses económicos. And many studies and much evidence point to the fact that almost all of the conflict in Colombia over the past decades and the forced displacement of uh, many, many communities, uh, as uh, Afro-descendant communities, indigenous communities, campesino communities, uh, is due directly to uh, the activity um, of, uh, of uh, multinationals and other uh, corporations who want to extract resources from various parts of the Colombian territory. También se ha demostrado que donde quiera que se ha hecho gran extracción de recursos naturales es donde la pobreza y la miseria se ha incrementado para los pobladores. Also been shown that precisely where large mining and extractive activity has taken place, uh, poverty and misery has in fact increased for a lot of local people. ¿Qué podrían hacer ustedes o qué podrían hacer desde Canadá? Hacer, estar muy atento al actuar de las empresas en nuestros territorios. What, what can we all do from Canada? But well, one thing is that we need to pay more attention to what our companies do abroad. Exigir del gobierno canadiense informar a los pueblos indígenas sobre los intereses y las empresas que tienen o van a tener presencia en los territorios. We can demand that our government uh, and our, our companies be more transparent about which entities and which corporations, which companies are going to be active and where in Colombia, because often that information is not forthcoming and not clear. Estar muy atento a la situación de derechos humanos en esos territorios donde hacen presencia las empresas canadienses. Continue to observe and, and follow up on human rights violations and respect for or lack thereof of human rights in areas where Canadian companies are active in Colombia. Eh, exigir también del gobierno canadiense posibilite la presentación de informes alternativos por parte de, de los pueblos indígenas eh, en el marco de ese compromiso que tiene presentar un informe de los impactos del Tratado de Libre Comercio con Colombia. The demand of, of our government, of the Canadian government, uh, to make sure that there is uh, 
feed in participation of Indigenous peoples in Colombia in the annual reporting process that must take place under the Canada Colombia Free Trade Agreement. Um, there has to be a, a report produced for Parliament, and uh, there needs to be um, there needs to be Indigenous participation and consultation in that process. So that's where I'll leave it for now because we'll have questions. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll, uh, we'll come back to this uh, after Anne-Marie has spoken, but I would just point out to you that the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples has um, called for an, an independent assessment on the emergency situation that is facing Indigenous Peoples in Colombia, including a call for the UN <coughs> Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide to visit Colombia and do an assessment on the situation there. So now we'll go to Anne-Marie. So, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just want to first, uh, before I start, to just acknowledge the Algonquin uh, traditional territory that uh, um, I am speaking on today. I come from um, Nakasli, which is in north central British Columbia. If, uh, so, from Vancouver, if you were to drive to my community, it's about a 12 hour drive. Luckily for airplanes uh, from Vancouver, it's an hour flight to Prince George, which is the closest city, and, and then another two-hour drive um, west and then north to get to the town of Fort St. James, and, and that's where we traveled in from yesterday. So a long day for us. Um, in our area, we have um, we belong or born into clans, and each clan has has a responsibility for for um, different parts of our culture and in our area. And for um, my clan, I follow my, my mother's side, which is the frog clan. And, and so we are protectors of water, is, is what uh, we are born into. And, um, and then I also, I think, um, have uh, taken on some of my dad's clan, which is the Beaver clan, and they are the warriors in our area. Thomas Yu is what, uh, how you say it in our, our language. And so I come to you and tell you a story about how I am fighting as a warrior to protect the water in our area. Um, so in Nakesley, we have um, what is called Keo, in our language, it's the area we go to for survival, um, where the families have certain areas within the Nakesley territory that they hunt, that they fish, that uh, they collect uh, berries and, and gather medicinal plants in. And um, where I was raised and where um, my, my father and my grandfather and my great-grandfather were is an area called the Nation River area. And this, is, this area is part of the Arctic watershed, so when you get to Fort St. James, you drive up about 40 minutes north and you hit the Continental Divide, this is where, so where the water starts running to, to the north. Um, and, and in our, our language, I mean, knowing where you're from and where the waters are going was very important because you needed to know where your territory ended. And so, so in the north, uh, the rivers uh, and the creeks usually had the, the ending um, ka at the end, so mezalinka, pazalinka, almanika are rivers in, in, our, in the northern area, but ko were rivers that ran to the Pacific, so we're part of the Fraser River area. Just to give you uh, geography of setting up where, where we are, um, I always, um, took for granted that where we were was so far north and I thought nobody would really be interested in there and really didn't really think about uh, about mining or how logging was going to impact us. We always just went back to our, our cabins in our, in our traditional territory. And, um, and then in, 90, in the late 80s and early 90s, a mining company came Came in. I was, I mean, I just graduated from high school in '91. In '93, I started hearing about the possible mine, and actually, 
by that time a mine had been approved and it was called the Mount Milligan Project. Um, at that time it was owned by Placer Gold or Placer Dome and um, because of the gold prices dropping drastically it's such a low grade of copper and gold that the project was shelved and um, and, and to, I mean, I, at the time I didn't realize how lucky we, we were that, that it did not go ahead. Uh, but we just left it at that through the 90s. We, we left it at, um, okay, they were going to plan a mine, but they didn't. And nobody really talked about it or prepared or planned or talked to, with the communities or to, to the government about, the, about this until um, 2006 when... All of a sudden, we get a call from an exploration company called Terrain Metals, and they say, oh, um, we just wanted to let you know we have an exploration permit to drill in your area. Um, we thought it would be nice of us to stop by and talk to you and, and see what you think about this. And, and so in 2006, I was um, just finishing up a project on the Enbridge, um, Enbridge Gateway uh, Pipeline that is proposed from Alberta to, to Kitimat in British Columbia and actually was on mat leave. I just had my youngest daughter and so I, I was able to, I was at home and able to attend this meeting in June 2006 and my family said, well we don't really know what this company is about, we don't know what they want to do but we, and we really liked what you did on Enbridge because um, what we did there was we set up a process, we said you know, there's a cost of doing business in our territory, and we should have the right to to um, look at how your proposed project would impact us on five main components. Um, so, environmentally, how how would uh, a mine impact us socially? How would a mine impact us culturally, economic, and legally? And, and that um, to allow you into our territory you should provide money to our community to, so that we could hire consultants and hire, uh, bring in people that could help us really understand this project. And that's where you know, the, the free prior and informed consent, it shouldn't be a cost to the community to figure out how a project is going to impact them. And, and so that's, um, in, in 2006, we, we started this process. Uh, the, I think back to it, and at the time I was on mat leave, and, and my family just said, well, you're not doing anything, Anne. You know, you're not working, so here's the project description. There's a gold copper mine being proposed in our area. Read this information that you got and tell us what you think about it. And, and so after bringing on, um, finding some people out there uh, just by chance, uh, tried, nobody had... And we had, uh, in our area, done this. And what happens in the, with a lot of communities is that they feel like they're very alone in this whole process of uh, when there's a company coming in. And, and for me, I was one person up against a, a, a mining company, a junior mining company, that had, they had access to engineers and to geologists and to a whole, AMAC is their, was their company that they hired that did all their environmental reviews and everything. And, and there was just me advising, advising chief and council and our family on what steps we should, should, we should do and, and what, um, how we should proceed with this. And we really felt that uh, the important part was that we be given the chance to review their, in, their information that they were providing to us, that not the company come in with their consultants and uh, which they had proposed to us, we'll hire, you know, we'll hire AMAC or we'll hire an environmental consultant. They'll come in, they'll gather your traditional knowledge, and then they will tell that, take that information and tell us how we're going to impact you. And we said, that's not the way it's going to happen here. We said, you provide the funds to us, we will hire our own consultants and we will hire our own people to be able to, to provide, to put a document together that would say this is how we are going to be impacted. And we will keep that information and we only share 
what you need for your environmental assessment process or what you need to give to the government, we will provide that. We will provide that for you. That was a, a shock to the company. I think um, they they were used to going into com into communities and saying, "This is the information we need. Here are the people that are going to gather it." And thank you very much for your information. And walking away, and and so um, that I think threw them threw them off. Uh, they weren't sure what to what to do with Nat Gasly, and all of a sudden we are hearing questions that we were we were being too um, asking too many questions um, that we we should just from the local community, especially because the logging industry had gone um, had just disappeared because of the mountain pine beetle that had wiped out and killed all the the logs um, the tree the pine trees in our area. So logging was really on a decline, and people were desperate in our in our small community to find jobs. And the mining company jumped on that and said, "Well, we could we could come in. We'll provide you all the jobs you need, and, and you just let us come in." And so then we were seen as the bad people for asking the questions about the environment. We were asking them, uh, "Is there going to be clean water? Are we going to be able to access?" The lands that that we have for generations. Are we going? You know, are are we going to be able to hunt in the area? And the one thing that um, really I try to, to share when I talk about our experiences is that the land is where we get our identity from. The land makes me a Dakka a woman that is part of the Frog Clan. And um, what I worry about is, is my six-year-old daughter is, if she used to get her identity from the land, and now the land that she used to go to is a open pit mine with, uh, with uh, I think they're planting three pits and um, tailings ponds and waste piles, and that's what she has to go to, what kind of identity will she have? And, and, and that's something that, any environmental assessment that you look at that the government does does not ask the question of how a development will impact the culture, how it will impact the indigenous people that rely on the land for more than for more than just you know providing food to us, but for providing a, um, who we are and connecting us to the land. So um, in a matter. We were able, after a while, to convince the company to to see it our way. Um, it, it was it was very difficult, uh, difficult process. We proposed an, an environmental assessment in British Columbia, which was unheard of, because each government, um, I'm assuming each province has their own assessment process. So in, in BC, they're, they're, the minister can adopt. Um, go to a process that he thinks um, set up something individual just for that project and and we we asked them to do that in this case we said this area is so important to us it's not that we're against the project we, we read the writing on the wall economic development is going to trump our rights but if there's going to be a mine in our area we want it to be the best environmental mine. We want to be able to have be involved in the monitor, and we want to be involved in every aspect of the development of this project. And BC pretty much just said no. They said, "Thank you for your proposal. Thank you for putting all the work into this, but we have a process in place. You have 180 days to tell us what your your comments are and what your concerns are about a project. Um, but other than that, that's." It's already set up, so we're not going to listen to you. And um, from 2006 to 2009, that was my world. For that's what Ella grew up in. It is it is uh, environmental assessment process, trying to review what was going on, what the impact was. And uh, by 2009, the end of 2009 or early 2009, the BC government approved the project. Um, on, in 2010, um, November 2nd, 2010, does anybody know what happened on November 2nd, 2010? That's a day that's going to burn the rest of my life in, in, in my, uh, my brain is 
Uh, some of you might have heard of the Prosperity Mine in British Columbia. It's a mine that the federal government denied and said no to, and we were very surprised by that. Uh, but in the same press release that went out on that day, they said no to Prosperity, uh, but they said yes to Mount Milligan. Two projects that were, if you look at the scope and the size of them, very similar. Um, impacts, major impacts to fish habitat, and, and yet uh, they kind of compromised with the industry saying, well, we're going to say no to this one, but here you go. You could go go away with this. And time-wise, am I okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, <clears throat> so we had to, our community came back together and said, well, we've put all our concerns out there. Nobody is listening to us. We've been told that if you engage a company early, that then things will be different. We've been told that if you engage the government early, things will be different and people will listen. And we did, I think, everything we could to put everything on the table and to just be honest and, and trust in that somebody would listen to us. And, and then yet here we had a mine approved without any consent from our community. And how the company got around that issue of requiring, requiring um, consent was our neighboring nation to the east of us, um, who, who we totally acknowledged was going to be impacted by this project and that um, Nat Kesley felt we really needed to work together. Um, the company went to them and said, well, you know, um, if, uh, if you could say yes to this and you could just end all the discussion that we're having with Nat Kesley and we don't have to listen to them anymore, because really it's your territory. And, and that's what the government did is, is just, um, they, they said, well, this community is only 68 kilometers away from the mine site, so they are gonna, they're the dominant nation because they're gonna be the most impacted. So when I sat at the negotiation table with BC, I had with me, um, I asked my family and one of the, the mappers in our office to map out how close our cabins and hunting areas were to the mine site. Our closest cabin was 13 kilometers from, from the mine site. Um, other cabins, 20 kilometers, 30, 40, all less than the 68 kilometers of the dominant First Nation. And, and yet we were totally um, left out of a, a process, um, totally denied any rights to the area to this, to this day, don't have, um, you know, you hear about impact benefit agreements with mining companies. We don't have one, but we're directly impacted by this. And the other part of mining that um, companies and government tend not to talk about is the social impacts that come with mining and the health impacts. And, and we are seeing that now. Um, we were promised lots of jobs and we were promised lots of economic opportunities. We've got none of those. Um, and and the social impacts and health we're seeing right now. Um, the one thing that is raising, um, going up in our community is the number of drug dealers because uh, they say the mine, the mine site is drug free and alcohol free, but uh, I'm sure if you, you did a study on the alcohol consumption and um, the drug use in our community, it has risen dramatically. Uh, when you read the research that is out there, the major population that is impacted are Aboriginal women. And the concern I have is I have a six-year-old daughter and for 20 years now, so when she's 26, she's gonna grow up in a mining town. And if it's Aboriginal women that are mostly impacted, my question is how do I protect her? And I have two daughters, one 11 and one six. And nobody, has, nobody asks those questions. And, um, and so Nakazi was forced to find researchers. I mean, if there's anybody here that is doing their MA or PhD, <laughs> hey, we're at a university, uh, talk to me, we're looking for researchers. We have a project going on, on um, from start to finish of a mine, uh, researching and, and taking in the data of how this mine is gonna impact our town from now until 22 years down the road and to, to review those changes. And hopefully what we're hoping for is that if we start seeing deviations or things changing dramatically, that we'll be able to go to the government 
and say we need services here because this is the data, this is what we need, we need from you. And, and we have had to start that. Not The government is not doing that, the company is not doing that. Um, community, the community of Port St. James and Nakesley have come together to say this is important to us. And, and so um, it's not just about jobs and economics, it's, a, it's about the identity of a people. We have the right, my daughter has the right to, to hunt and fish in the area that I grew up in. And um, in October of, October of 2010 was the last time her and I, it was her first uh, time going beaver hunting when she was four. We went to the, to the headwaters where the mine was proposed and a beautiful area, if I could show you pictures, I, I would have. Um, and I didn't realize at that time when we were there that was going to be my last time seeing that area. Because when I went back in June of 2011, I tried to go back before that, but they wouldn't let me in. So June of 2011, I finally got back to the same site. And the, the headwaters was gone, the creek was gone, it was a construction site and they were building the dam. And it was unrecognizable to our family and um, to us. So, so to just finish up, um, it's it's heartbreak, heartbreaking for me to have to tell you this story because um, I just I keep telling my story because I hope that this never has to happen to another community in Canada or else elsewhere. Um, and. I keep working on this because I, I think we can do things differently, we can do things better, involving the people that are gonna be impacted by resource development. And um, I think that's where I just, I'll, I'll end. I have lots to, a lot to say and uh, 